All right, this morning I've been teaching on the uh, positive ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we've covered a lot of things. I hadn't got time to go back and um, go through all of that, but I made a list here of 20 ministries that the Holy Spirit has to us. And this is by no means a all-inclusive list. These are just 20 things that I just sat down and, and real quickly kind of wrote these things out. And I believe that it'll just increase your understanding of the Holy Spirit and how He moves in your life and make you more receptive to Him. First of all, let me, let's turn over to Genesis chapter 1 and let me make this point. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And this obviously is talking about Jesus. So you put that together with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 says Jesus created everything. Colossians chapter 1 says all things were made by him. And so you see that Jesus and God are the same. First uh, Timothy chapter 3, I believe, verse 16. See, the first or second Timothy says great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The only time God was manifest in the flesh is when Jesus came to this earth. And so there's many scriptures that show Jesus is God. He wasn't just a godly man. He was God in the flesh. And so you see in verse 1, the unity between God and Jesus. And then in verse 2, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So right here in the first two verses of the Bible, you see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, let me just turn over quickly and read these verses. You see that the Holy Spirit is also God. In Acts chapter 5, this is where Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 3, that Peter said... Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Verse 3 says you lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says you lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God. And this is what the church world calls... Uh, the Trinity, I don't know how to explain that. I just have accepted it, that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. And sometimes critics have tried to say, see, that shows that Jesus wasn't fully God. He couldn't do anything by himself. That doesn't show that he wasn't fully God. It shows the unity of God, that, that Jesus could not separate himself from God, the Father, and from the Holy Spirit. They are one. Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the great declarations of the Bible. Behold, the Lord our God is one God. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God. But He is manifest as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I can't wrap my brain around that. I don't have a good illustration for it. I don't know how to explain it. People have tried to say it's like an egg. you got the shell, the white, and the yolk. There's three parts, and yet it's all one. And yet that's not really a good... I don't know how to explain it, but I tell you what, I can see it in the Bible, and I just accept it. So my point in saying all of this is that as we talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. And you really cannot separate the Holy Spirit from God the Father or from the Son except for the purposes of discussion, to discuss some things. But they all operate independently. So you could, as we talk about ministries of the Holy Spirit, we could just talk about everything that God does. And He does it through the Holy Spirit. God doesn't do things without the Holy Spirit. Over here in Genesis chapter 1, he, the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The actual Hebrew word is that He brooded. 
He brooded over the face of the waters and then boom, light came forth and life came forth. The Holy Spirit was involved in creating this universe, life, everything. For those of you that may not have heard yet, it didn't come from a big bang. It came from the Holy Ghost brooding on the face of the waters. And we were created on purpose by God. We didn't happen and we haven't evolved. We were created by God. And the Holy Spirit is the one who did all of this. So really, it's some of the things I'm going to be talking about are just for the purpose of, of trying to impress on you how important the ministry of the Holy Spirit is in your life. But technically, you can't separate uh, the Holy Spirit from God and from Jesus. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how that God anointed Jesus with power and with the Holy Ghost, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Everything that Jesus did was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus never performed a miracle. He didn't start his ministry. Jesus didn't do anything until the Holy Spirit came upon him. And again, some people think, well, Jesus just wasn't uh, very powerful then by himself. No, it's because they're one. He couldn't operate independent of the Holy Spirit and His Father. They were one. If Jesus couldn't or wouldn't minister without the Holy Spirit, it's the height of arrogance for anybody to think that you can minister without the Holy Spirit. If Jesus was dependent upon the Holy Spirit, then we should be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, this, there's a scripture, I think it's Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, somewhere around there, that says, Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. This is one of the reasons that so many people are frustrated, is because they, they have good intentions, they're good people, but they're just out there on their own. And one of the greatest lessons that you can learn is that you are not sufficient to make it on your own. You need the power of God in your life. I have so many people come up to me and ask for prayer, and, and it's just amazing Sometimes I wonder, you couldn't have gotten into this much trouble on your own. There has to be some kind of a demonic intervention. Nobody could make this much of a mess out of their life. Nobody could get this sick on their own. And yet it's just the results of people living their life under their own steam and own power. And, and they're good people. But I tell you, God did not create you to direct your own steps. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23... The Lord is, is issuing a rebuke to the Israelites because they had forsaken the covenant and he was prophesying that they would go into exile. And Jeremiah, as he was prophesying that the enemy would come in and defeat them and kill their young men and rape the women and take the women who were already pregnant and cut them up and cut the babies out of them. Terrible things. Jeremiah, in the midst of his own prophecy, said, how could this happen to the people who were the... Apple of God's eye, the people who were the jewel of the whole earth, who were so blessed. How could this happen to them? And then he answers his own question in chapter 10, verse 23, and he says, But I know that, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. You know why such destruction came to him? Because God never created us to rule our own life. He created us to be dependent upon Him and be led by Him. And the reason our life is in such mess is because we have leaned unto our own understanding and we've done things our way. There's a God way of doing things. There's a human way of doing things. And the ways, that, uh, the ways of man are the ways of death. They lead to destruction. You know, my mother just died June the 1st of 2010. Or two, when was it? 2009, I guess. She died June 1st. She was 96 years old. And I spent a lot of time with her right before she died. And she was an awesome lady. And she was so blessed by what God was doing through our ministry. And she was saying, tell me again about all these things that are happening overseas. And I was telling her about all of this stuff and how people's lives were being changed. And, and just awesome things that were happening. And she was really blessed by it. And she looked at me, put her little bony finger right in my face, and she said, Andy, you know this is God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know this is God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. 
And I said, you're right, amen, and it's absolutely true. Those are about her last words to me. You aren't smart enough to do this. And it's absolutely true. I can guarantee you it's not because I figured these things out. It's the blessing of God. And I'm telling you what, you aren't smart enough to live your life either. You have the privilege of choosing to do it. God won't force you. He's not going to make you follow His ways. But I tell you, the smartest decision you'll ever make in your life is to quit running your own life and turn it over to God and ask for His direction. And the way He gives this direction to us is through the Holy Spirit. You need to be conscious of the Holy Spirit. You need to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You need to welcome the Holy Spirit. You need to seek the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I pity those of you, in a sense, that are so gifted and so talented that you can do things on your own. Because that tends to make you think that you can handle it. In a way, it's really a blessing. Not to be able to do anything on your own, because it makes you God-dependent. It's really good. The Bible says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, You see your calling, brother, how the God didn't choose many mighty, not many noble. I forget the exact wording of it, but... You see your calling, brother, and how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world... And to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, so that no flesh would glory in His presence. You know, God's not a lowbrow. It's not that He's against people who have education and talents and abilities. He loves all of us. It's just that people who have their act together and are so gifted and talented tend to think that they can do it. And they aren't God dependent. And so God has to use the people who know that they need help. And the truth is, if you're talented and gifted and if you're a millionaire and very successful, the truth is you could have done much better if you'd have been led by the Holy Spirit. But it's just sometimes... People that don't have a lot of giftings and talents are the one, only ones that are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And those are the ones that God will supernaturally empower. I held a meeting in Denver, Colorado one time, and a man wrote in afterwards, and, and my mother was the one that was opening the mail at the time. She brought this letter to me. She just loved it and thought this was great. And uh, she brought this letter to me, and this man told me that he had been called to the ministry 10 or 12 years before. But when he tried to go into the ministry, his wife got upset and divorced him. He lost his family. And for 10 years, he had just been in grief and in mourning, thinking, how could God ever use me? And he came to my meeting, heard me minister, saw miracles happen, saw people's lives change. And he wrote in this letter, and he says told me the story, and then he says, I thought God couldn't use me, but after seeing God use you, I decided I'd go into the ministry. If God could use you, He could use me. And my mother just thought that was awesome and brought it to me. And he had a statement in there, and he says, how come you got to be a hick from Texas before God will use you? And he was comparing me to Copeland or Hagen or somebody. And I wrote him back, and I said, it's because hicks from Texas know that they need God. (laughs) God's not against you being smart and educated and talented, but I'm telling you, I don't care who you are. Your flesh may be better than my flesh. You might have USDA choice flesh, but the flesh still doesn't please God. It's enmity with God, and you've got to learn to walk in the Spirit. We need to be dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You need to start every day thinking about, God, I need the leadership and the power of the Holy Spirit. And praise Him that it is given to us. It's not like you have to beg for it. He wants to lead you more than you want to be led, but you have to be open to it. You have to be looking for it. So the very first thing over in uh, John chapter 6, verse 44, this is Jesus speaking. And in John chapter 6, verse 44... It says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. And again, this isn't necessarily using the name of the Holy Spirit, but God does everything through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that draws people to God. And there's a lot of significance. I could preach for an hour on this. I've got 20 things I'm going to try and go through today and tonight. And so I'm just going to hit this quickly. But one of the things is that you just can't come to God when you choose to. You will hear people say, well, man, I'm gonna, I plan on getting right with God before I die, but right now I'm busy doing this or they've got to focus on whatever and they just aren't giving a priority to God. You just can't come to God when you want to. The Holy Spirit has to draw you and you cannot just choose to come to God. There is no guarantee that God is going to draw you up until your last breath. And so you need to recognize that if the Holy Spirit is drawing you, if you've got a drawing, a desire. You know, this is one of the things like what Wendell and I were saying. There's so many that raise their hand and say, if you didn't have any of these things, how many of you desire to go to Bible college? The Holy Spirit is the one that gives you those desires. The devil will never put it in your heart to go to Bible college. The devil doesn't want you sitting under the Word. This is not the devil. That is the Holy Spirit. And if you have a desire, you know what? You need to strike while the iron is hot. There's no guarantee that he's going to keep drawing you. It's not just like he guarantees 10 years from now, you, after you do your thing and get your kids raised and do your own thing, that you can just choose to do it. I have people come to me all the time and they say, man, I believe God's calling me into the ministry. I believe I'm supposed to come to Bible school, but... In another five years, ten years, I can retire and get full retirement. And so I'm just planning on waiting. Well, it's a shame that God didn't know that. Why didn't he wait five years to put this desire in your heart? Why didn't he wait until everything was the way you thought it was supposed to be? If he gave you the desire now, it's because God's got something he's trying to draw you to now. One of the points that I get from this is that, you know what, when God gives me a desire for something, man, I follow it. Because I can't just come to God on my own. If I have a desire to spend the day studying and praying, I can't just put it off and say, well, next week I'll do it. This weekend I'll do it. If God puts that desire in my heart, I do it. I pretty much follow the desires that God puts in my heart. Psalms chapter 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean He'll give you whatever you want, but it means that when you are putting God first, He puts His desires in your heart. And this is one of the ways that I follow the leadership of the Lord. I have known since the very beginning that someday I'd be on television. I did a lot of television stuff, and I received, I mean, supernatural results. One program in in, uh, Chicago back in the 80s produced over a thousand requests in one day. That's phenomenal. And I've always been blessed. And I knew someday I'd do television, but I also knew it was expensive, and I just didn't have a desire to do it then. And I had people offer me television time and everything else. And I had no desire for it. I knew it was part of my future, but I had no desire for it. And then in the summer of 1998, I was just praying about things. And I mean, boom, like that. My desire changed. And I thought, man, I want to go on television. I sat down. I drew a set. I knew exactly what I was. And I wanted to be on television so badly. It was such a radical change in my desires And I said, you know what, I've been delighting myself in the Lord, and I know that this is God. And that's how we started on television. I used to have no desire to be on, uh, have a Bible school. I had lots of people ask me to start a Bible school, and I said, no way. I said, I don't want people to go out with my name on them and act like the jerks that I see that came from Bible school. (laughs) And I had no desire for a Bible school. It's a long story, but in 1993... Just like that, God changed my heart, and all of a sudden, I wanted a Bible school. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit drawing you. He's the one that puts desires in your heart. And when you are desiring godly things, now this, you need to qualify this and judge it by Scripture. Amen. If you're thinking, I desire a new wife, that's not God. 
He hates divorce. You need to check everything. But I'm saying when you are delighting yourself in the Lord and all of a sudden you have these godly desires, you need to recognize that it's not your human nature does not desire godly things. And when you have godly desires come to you, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you and leading you. And you need to follow it. No man can come unto God except the Holy Spirit draw it. Another application of this is I have people come to me all the time and they say, oh, man, I just love God so much. I love I want to know God. And they get frustrated about I, I just can't get from where I am to there. What do I have to do? And they're frustrated, feeling like that this is them. You know, again, if you have a desire for God, if you're excited about the things of God, news bulletin, it's because God's already working in your life. God's the one to put the desire there. You didn't come up with it. If you're excited about the things of God, if you're in love with God, don't get frustrated. You're already a manifest evidence that God is working in your life. You don't desire the things of God on your own. If you want the things of God, it's a token that God's already moved. It amuses me. People who are praying for revival and, oh, God, I long for revival. And they think they long for revival more than God does. Carnal people don't long for revival. If you've got a longing for revival, it's because revival has already started on the inside of you. You don't long for revival. It's not us that are pleading for revival. It's God who's putting revival on the inside of you. And yet people get together and join together and try and get 100,000 or 200,000 people together and force God into having a revival. It's God who's trying to get you revived. God wants it more than you do. And if you want revival, it's because the power of the Holy Spirit's already working on the inside of you. No man can be drawn to God except the Father, the Holy Spirit, using the, the Father, using the Holy Spirit, draws you unto Himself. You know, if you're at this meeting on a Saturday, this isn't Sunday. This isn't the nod to God crowd. If you are here, it's because God is already working in your heart. The Holy Spirit is already moving on you. God has changed your desires. Man, that's awesome. You know, we could quit right here if you really understood this, that, Father, you're already moving in my life. The very fact that I desire to hear the Word of God and to learn things. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. You could take joy and, and peace in that and be encouraged in that. And yet, many times, people just dismiss these desires. Again, Wendell mentioned this, but I've had so many people, after we promote the Bible school, come up and say, I want to come to Bible school. Would you please pray with me? I'm just not sure if it's God. <laughs> and I used to try and explain it to them. Now, I just, well, I understand. Maybe the devil is the one that put it in your heart. To come to Bible school. That sounds like something that the devil, the flesh, would want. People just look at me like, that, that couldn't be the devil, could it? No, it can't. If you're drawn to God, it's because the Holy Spirit is the one that drew you. And there's a lot more we could say about that. Look at this in Luke chapter 12. And in verse 12, this is about the Holy Spirit giving you words to speak. Supernaturally teaching you what to say. In Luke chapter 12, and in verse 12, it's talking about persecution. In verse, let's go back to verse 11. It says, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and into magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. This is another thing that I don't think we depend upon the Holy Spirit near enough for. We are constantly leaning unto our own understanding and ministering from our brain instead of our hearts. You know, this is hard to communicate, and I spend an entire course in our Bible school teaching on this to our third year students. But effective ministry is not head to head, it's heart to heart. You have to connect with people on a heart level. You have to reach people on a heart level, not a head level. And so much ministry today is head to head. 
And one of the ways that we try and accomplish this in our school is that in the third year, I talk about how to minister and how do you prepare yourself and how do you minister the Word. And one of the things we make our students do is give two ten-minute talks. And the first one, they can prepare and have all of the notes that they want to and minister anything that they want to. The second ten-minute talk, they don't have a clue what the subject is. They have to stand up there and I just give them a subject. And they have to wing it. And you know, uh, I've I've actually read uh, things about this and they say that the number one fear in people is public speaking. That people fear that more than they fear death. There are some of you right here that that's exactly the way you are. Doing what I'm doing right here, I was an introvert. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. That's not an exaggeration. I was totally paralyzed in front of people. And this is absolutely impossible for me to do what I'm doing right now in my own flesh. And so I can relate to that. And I've actually had people quit school and refuse to go into the second year because of that 10-minute talk. They liked everything about it, but they weren't about to give this 10-minute talk. But the reason I do that is because you have to learn to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. You can't just minister out of your own intellect and be led only by your own understanding. You need to have the Holy Spirit inspire you. Like, for instance, one of the examples I use a lot is that in the very beginning of my ministry, when I was traveling, the Lord... uh, I had a meeting set up in Nacogdoches, Texas, in a church that I had never been to before or since. I didn't know anybody. I just had an invitation and I accepted. I've changed the way I do things since this. But I went to this church not knowing a single person. And I arrived about an hour and a half early. I got there and a woman came running out of the church crying and handed me a letter and got in her car and left. And I opened it up, and it was a letter from the pastor, which was this woman's husband. And he wrote and announced to her that I'm leaving you. I'm running off with the church secretary. I'm going to get a divorce, and I'm going to marry her. And I chose tonight to do it because Andrew's going to be here, and he will know how to explain it to the church and tell them what to do. And it was the first his wife had heard about it, so she left, and she wasn't there. And I had to announce to the church that the pastor just ran off with the church secretary. And you know what? If I had decided to teach on healing, that just wouldn't have been appropriate. I had to deal with the situation. And you know what? There's no way to prepare for that. How do you prepare for that kind of thing? You have to let the Holy Spirit lead you. And it's amazing how people just, they want to get everything so organized so that they, they uh, if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, they'll have it all figured out and they'll still look good. And again, in a sense, the way I minister is an overreaction to my own carnality. I was such an introvert that... I would prepare copious notes. I would have page after page after page of notes because I was so afraid that something would happen and I'd run out of things to say. And so I would have it all figured out. And it was a bomb every time. For the first two years I ministered, it was so embarrassing. You may still think it's embarrassing, but it was worse. It used to be a lot worse. And it was so embarrassing that I swore with an oath that I'd never embarrass God or me again and get up and minister. And yet it was like Jeremiah 20 verse 9 says, it was like fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't forbear. I had to speak. And I'd ask God to forgive me and I'd try it again. And every time I tried to minister for the first two years, it was pitiful. More pitiful than it is now. And... But during that period of time, I was studying the Word 10, 12, 15 hours a day. Man, God was just showing me awesome things. It was changing my life. And I would go to a meeting. This one friend of mine, Joe Nay, kind of my mentor, the guy that got me started, he would hold meetings that had anywhere from 100 to 300 people. And I'd be at the meeting and he'd say, uh, Andrew, do you have a testimony? 
And I hadn't prepared anything. I didn't know he was going to ask me for a testimony. So my first thought would be, oh, God, I don't have anything to say. It's got to be you. And I'd stand up and the word would just flow out of me. I was in the word constantly and the word would flow out of me and gifts of the spirit and people would start being healed and delivered and words of knowledge would happen. And Joe would come and take the microphone away and say, this is my meeting. You sit down. <laughs> Amen. And I'd sit down and I'd say, God, that was awesome. And I said, but I didn't prepare. When I prepare, it's bad. When I don't prepare, it's good. I said, it looks like Bible study and prayer and preparation is ruining my ministry. I said, what do I do? And finally, the Lord spoke to him and he says, it's because when you have time to prepare, you depend upon yourself and you minister out of your own ability. And he says, but if you would depend upon me, just like this, the Holy Ghost will teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. This does not mean that I'm never prepared. It just means that I don't prepare a specific message for a group of people. I prepare myself. Everything I'm telling you, God has told me for 20, 30 years. I've lived this. It's not like I don't know what I'm talking about. It's not like I'm not prepared. I just don't go in knowing exactly what I'm going to say. So you can't sit there and watch as the stomach turns and all of the lying and the adultery and stealing and then just stand up and... Let whatever come out, you're going to be in trouble. So anyway, I'm not going to, I'm not trying, that's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm just saying we need to get to where we depend upon the Holy Spirit. And the reason I minister the way I do is because I have a tendency, a fear, an insecurity. And so I have a tendency to try and prepare so I don't have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. And I just made a promise to God that I would never, ever prepare a message again. I'd prepare the messenger and let the Holy Spirit bring things out. And so that's the way that I minister. And it touches people because I'm ministering from my heart to people's heart. You have to depend upon the Holy Spirit. We've got to go beyond just intellectual knowledge. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If all you're getting is information... All that does is feed your carnality. You've got to learn how to be led by your spirit. This doesn't mean that you switch off your mind, but your mind has to be interpreted and analyzed by the spirit man. You have to take your thoughts and the knowledge and the wisdom that you have and submit it to the Holy Spirit. And you need to let the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you and speak through you. And this isn't just true for ministers. This is for all of us. If you're trying to reach your kids, if you're trying to reach your mate, if you're trying to reach the people in your Sunday school, if you're trying to share with the people that you're working with, it needs to be from your heart. The Holy Spirit will teach you and show you what to say and how to reach people. The Holy Spirit's smarter than you. Here's another application of this same truth, and that is that there are some of you who are praying for your mate to change and God to touch them, and the Holy Spirit can't get a word in edgewise because you are trying to do all of the convicting on your own. You know, Billy Graham said this, and this I didn't understand this at first, but it really has become a revelation to me that he had a change in his ministry about 1949 when he held this Los Angeles uh, crusade. And the, the number one thing that changed, some people would cite the fact that William Randolph Hearst got hold of him and said, Puff Graham, and they gave him publicity, and that's when his ministry really took off. But Billy Graham said... That the thing that made a change in his ministry was that the Lord told him, he says, you make a very poor Holy Spirit. And he says, you try and argue and convince people and force them, paint them into a corner to where they have to accept. He says, I didn't call you to do that. I called you to promote the truth. And then the Holy Spirit will take these truths and bear witness. And so Billy Graham changed his ministry and he quit trying to force people to believe, and he just started proclaiming truth. See, that's depending upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows how to reach people better than you do. And yet there's a lot of people that you think, oh, I'll I know how to do it. 
Man, the wife puts the Bible down and leaves it open and highlights the scripture that the husband needs to read. And you're constantly nagging and picking and doing this. And you know what? You just make a very poor Holy Spirit. You need to depend upon the Holy Spirit to flow through you and to inspire and speak things to you, not lean under your own understanding. Again, the reason we have so much problem in our life is because we've done it our way. You and Frank Sinatra. You know, I don't know Frank Sinatra from anybody. I don't know if he was born again. It doesn't look to me like there was any evidence of it in his life. And if he wasn't born again, I think part of hell is going to be his song. I did it my way, playing in the background throughout eternity. That Man, would that ever add to your punishment to think that, man, I was bragging about doing it my way. Doing it your way will get you killed. It'll destroy other people. We need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, a verse that I've already used in this series, says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. That has to be one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. I use that all of the time. Well, that's powerful. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Knowledge of God, the knowledge of the truth. It's the truth that sets you free, John 8, 32. Knowledge is the missing piece in most people's lives. We see these bumper stickers that says, what you don't know won't hurt you. That's absolutely untrue. What you don't know is killing you. You know, if the Lord tarries, someday they'll figure out what causes cancer and there'll be a cure. But right now, because we don't know what causes cancer and stuff, cancer is killing a lot of people. What we don't know is killing us. What we don't know about relationships is killing us. What we don't know about God is killing us. You need to renew your mind, and the Holy Spirit is sent to teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all things that Jesus spoke to you. All things, not some things. Man, that's powerful. You know, I have depended upon this. I, I've used this verse. I depend upon this. It's one of the things that I anchor my life on. And, you know, I don't know all things yet. I, I hadn't arrived, but I've left. Amen. I'm a lot further down the road than I used to be. And I can tell you what, this trusting the Holy Spirit to teach me things has taught me things that have just changed my life. And every one of you, you don't have to have somebody else teach you everything. We all need people that point us in the right direction. But you know what? You need to get to a place where you can have the Holy Spirit reveal things to you. And this is what the Holy Spirit sent for. But it takes time. You know, some of the ways I get revelation, I won't go into a lot of specifics. I'm going to say this real quick in the name of Jesus. But some of the ways, I, when I get stumbled in the research that I've done, and I'll just spend hours praying in tongues. And saying, Holy Ghost, you will teach me all things and lead me into all truth and bring all things to my remembrance. And I'll pray in tongues and ask God to interpret it. And I couldn't tell you how much of the Bible I understand today because I took that approach and just depended upon the Holy Spirit to give me a supernatural instruction. That's really simple. But it's powerful. And I can guarantee you there's people sitting right here that you have questions and you wonder about this and that. And you've gone to the scripture and you've read a few scriptures, but you still don't understand it. And with most people, that's just the end. If you can't figure it out with your brain, end of discussion. It's your heart that God gives you revelation through. You know, I'm not going to be able to do these things in the order. I had them written down. But look over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. See, even if I make notes, I never follow them. I very seldom ever make notes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, 
is talking about how he didn't come with enticing words of men's wisdom. Matter of fact, over in 2 Corinthians, he says, people, he was quoting some of his critics, and he says, they say that his speech is contemptible and his bodily presence is weak. Paul was not a great speaker. That's what his critics said about him. And so he said here in chapter 2, he says, I didn't come with excellency of speech. It wasn't wisdom. I didn't want your faith to be in man's wisdom, but I came in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And he was talking about this. And then down in verse uh, 9, he quotes and says, But as it is written, this is the quotation from Old Testament, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And most people just put a period right there. And they say, well... I hasn't seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them. We just can't know the things of God. Further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. And we write songs about it, and the average person just embraces ignorance. Thinking, well, we just can't know the things of God. That was what the Old Testament said because those people weren't born again and didn't have the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the next verse, verse 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit search all things, yea, the deep things of God. This isn't saying you can't know the things of God. It's saying you can't know the things of God with just your little peanut brain. You can't just figure it out intellectually. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to instruct us and to show us these things. Instead of this being just a dead end where we can only go this far and we just can't understand the things of God, this is saying that in your natural self, with your carnal mind, you can't understand the things of God. But if you would let the Holy Spirit, He will enlighten you and you can go to understanding things that you would have thought were beyond your ability. The Holy Spirit will give you a supernatural understanding. Man, I can't tell you how important that is. There's a scripture in Psalms 119, I forget the exact verse right now, I think it's around verse 100 or something, but it says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers for your precepts or my meditation or something like that, because I keep, because I keep my precepts. Isn't that a powerful verse? You can surpass your teachers if you will just meditate on the Word and imply the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth and teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You do not have to go through life like a blind person just falling and stumbling and falling off cliffs and waiting on disaster to hit. The Holy Spirit will lead you. I'm jumping ahead of myself again, but maybe I'll come back to it tonight. But in John 16, 13, I believe it says the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. You don't have to go through life and just wait on disaster around every corner. The Holy Spirit will tell you when there's something up there. The Holy Spirit will make you look smart. The Holy Spirit will make you look good. It's like my mother saying, you aren't smart enough to do this. I'm not smart enough. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that I have a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit will make you look good. The Holy Spirit will make things work. My brothers and sisters, I just, I don't know how, I don't have the words to convey to you how important the leading and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is in our life. And the sad truth is most of us aren't drawing on this. What a powerful gift God has given us. What an awesome gift. The Holy Spirit will just transform your life, and yet most of us are living a life very similar to our unsaved neighbors. You get sick, the same uh, plague that comes through, the same flu season, you get the flu just like the people that don't have the power of God. You get distressed over the financial situation the same way that the people that don't even know God. You worry about the same stuff that the people that don't know God worry about. You make the same mistakes that the people that don't know God make. Something's wrong with this picture, and it's because we aren't drawing and taking advantage of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to make us succeed. Praise the Lord. So he says, but we can know these things. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit in verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth not. In the next verse it says, Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's the same point that I was making a while ago, that Paul wasn't just speaking intellectually out of his mind to another person's mind. He was speaking heart to heart. He was, convic- he was speaking from the spirit man. He was being led by the spirit to touch people on a spiritual level, not just an intellectual level. And that's powerful. You know, many of us don't sit down and analyze things and figure this out. But you, whether you know it or not, you can tell the difference when somebody's just breaching you on an intellectual level and when somebody reaches you on a heart level. You can tell when it, man, this touched me at my heart level. This, it went down deep inside. And most of us don't sit there and analyze things. But when you get touched on a heart level, it's so much more powerful than just when you've got a piece of information. And so much of what we call ministry today is just intellectual. It may be accurate, the things that are being said, but it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's not spoken with any passion. There's no conviction in the heart, and because of it, it's just sound and brass and a tinkling symbol. It says this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I have all knowledge so that I can understand everything and the gift of prophecy... And yet, don't do it motivated by love. It profits me nothing. It also profits the people you're sharing with nothing if you're just ministering head to head. You need to be able to minister like he's saying, not in the things which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discern with your natural mind. This isn't just talking about a lost person. Of course, a lost person is 100% natural. But even if you're born again, your spirit is born again, but your mind is still natural. It has to be renewed. And even a born again Christian with just your natural mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. A verse that goes along with this is Romans chapter 8, verse 6, where it says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's like a mathematical equation. Carnal mindedness equals death. Spiritual mindedness equals life and peace. What is carnal mindedness? If you look, I think it's either the verse in front or after right there, it says... Um, Let me just turn over and read this. Romans chapter 8, so that I won't misquote it. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You know what? You want to know what being carnally minded is? It's just if your mind is stayed on carnal things, natural things. You're carnal. Carnal doesn't mean sinful. All sin is carnal, but not all carnality is sin. The word carnal is just talking about natural. Actually, if you look it up in Strong's, it means the flesh as stripped of skin. In other words, not just your epidermis, not just your physical skin, but it's talking about meat. Matter of fact, the word carny, the root of the word carnal, is the word we get chili con carne from. Chili with meat. It's the same word. The word carnal means meat. So when you say you're carnally minded, you're saying you're a meathead. It just means you're naturally minded. It doesn't have to be sin. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily into pornography or hate. It just means that you're dominated by the natural. You're carnal. And the carnal mind is enmity 
against God. That means it's the enemy of God. It's at war with God. There's the carnal mind itself isn't sin, but you've got to get beyond carnal. You've got to get beyond natural. You've got to get into supernatural. You've got to be spiritually minded. What is spiritual minded? John 6, 63 says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So being spiritually minded is being word minded. You are going to have to stick your nose in the Bible and you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit start meditating on this. And if it says right here in verse 5, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you are just dominated by natural things, it's going to produce death. The next verse, to be carnally minded, not again sinful minded, but just carnal minded, just be natural minded. It produces death. There are some of you in here that are good people. You don't go out and lie and steal. You aren't living in adultery. You're just wonderful, nice, carnal people. You live in the carnal people, but they're going to suffer. They're going to struggle because they just like everybody else. They're thinking in the natural and the natural controls them. Man, I'm telling you, this is so important to have the Holy Spirit get you out of the carnal and start thinking spiritually and start being inspired and letting the Holy Spirit quicken you so that you can see and think differently than a carnal person thinks. Carnal mindedness equals death. You know, I don't have to be with you and you plant your garden to tell what you planted. All I got to do is be there when something grows up. And I'll tell you what you planted because you only reap what you sow. Everybody understands that. Likewise, I don't have to go home with you to tell what you've been doing. Tell me what's happening in your life. Are you depressed, discouraged, fearful, worried, stressed out, sick, poor? If you are... Carnal mindedness equals death. And this isn't just talking about physical death. Depression is a form of death. It's a result of sin. The wages of sin is death. Anger is a result of death. If you are reaping death, it's because you've sowed death. Not necessarily sin and terrible rebellion towards God. Just being natural. Just being carnal. Just being human. The natural man can't overcome cancer, can't overcome poverty, can't overcome discouragement, can't overcome these things. You have to be spiritually minded produces life and peace. All that spiritual mindedness produces is life and peace. It doesn't produce death. You can't get death out of spiritual mindedness. I have people come to me all the time and say, I've done everything the Bible says and it still hasn't worked. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Spiritual mindedness produces life and peace. You may have thought you were spiritually minded. You might have been religious minded. You might have been more spiritually minded than somebody else. But I guarantee you, spiritual mindedness produces life and peace, period. End of discussion. And somebody might take offense offense and say, well, you're saying I'm wrong. Well, I'd rather say you're wrong than God's wrong. God said spiritual minded produces life and peace. I'm just telling you, this is what the Holy Spirit is sent to do is to quicken your understanding and lead you into all truth, bring all things to your remembrance. We need this ministry of the Holy Spirit. You need to depend upon the Holy Spirit. You need to get beyond your own little peanut brain. You need to start living out of your heart. You need to let God start leading you by your heart. Man, that's powerful. I need to quit. I'm not through. we are just quit. And we'll pick up again tonight. Man, I've got a lot of things to say about the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was born again when I was eight years old. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 18 years old. And during those ten years, if I'd have been arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't have been enough evidence to convict me. I was truly born again, but I had no power in my life, no victory. Matter of fact, the guy who was my best friend in grade school, 
saw me on television. And he came out with his wife and met me and Jamie and I went out to eat with them. And he gave me his testimony, he, how he became an alcoholic. And he went into a rehab center and that's where he met his wife and they got married. And he was just talking about how awesome Jesus was and how he had totally changed his life. And he said, so when did you get born again? I said, when I was eight. And he just looked at, you were born again back when we were best friends. My best friend didn't know it. I didn't have any power of God in my life. But you know, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's just like, man, something changed. My life transformed. And I'm shocked at the number of people that come and receive the Holy Spirit. And they may even speak in tongues, but somehow or another, they just don't go on. They don't submit to the Holy Spirit. And they walk out and they continue to live the same type of life. It's not because God didn't give them the power. It's just because they didn't draw on it. But when Jamie and I received, Jamie could tell you about the exact time she received the Holy Spirit. It changed our life. I mean, it's just like we were going this way and boom, we went the other direction. The Holy Spirit has been super important in my life. And it's transformed my life. I can't even consider, I don't want to consider what my life would be like without the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage every one of you that we need to put a higher priority on having the Holy Spirit function in our life. You need to seek the leadership. Depend upon the Holy Spirit more. We need to pray in tongues more. Praying in tongues just puts you over into a realm of the Spirit that you don't get to any other way. You need to be flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully that this conference, if if nothing else, is just going to make you open the door a little wider so that the Holy Spirit can have more entrance into your life. And if you'll do that, I guarantee you, God has a perfect plan for every person. You will just be transformed. The things that will come as a result of this meeting will be life-changing. There could be tens of thousands, millions of people's lives. There's some of you that would go out of here and you would reach thousands and thousands of people. There's some of you that would go to the other side of the world. There's some of you that would begin to prosper in business and finance the kingdom of God and Who knows what would happen if every person in here was listening to the Holy Spirit? I can guarantee you this. If you were listening and responding to the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be sitting in front of your TV just like a knot on a log doing nothing, wasting your life away. Man, the Holy Spirit's got plans for your life. He will guide you into something that will excite you so much that you'll wake up in the morning just excited about, man, what does God have planned today? If you aren't excited about your life, then you aren't being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will make your life interesting. Amen? Praise God. Is there anybody here who does not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It would be a sin for me to teach on this, inspire you, and then let you go without receiving the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, which is separate from just being born again... You need to be born again. But then Jesus told his disciples, even after they're born again, tarry until you receive power from on high. You need a separate experience where the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And it includes many things, but speaking in tongues is an important part of it. We've already had, what was it, 130, 40 people baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. There was only 120 on the day of Pentecost. Man. If all of these went out and started flowing in the past, think what those 120 did. Before the day was over, there was 3,000. And now there are millions and billions of Christians because 120 got filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, if all of us here were to walk out of here full of the Holy Spirit and being led of the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you there's enough power to change Phoenix. We could see some awesome things happen. Is there anybody in here who has not received the Holy Spirit?